so I'm Sam Brown. Um, I was talking about Windows kind of security and how it's kind of evolved recently, and at the end of the run through. So I'm kind of exploiting some kind of modern recent releases of Windows 10 and how they work, and kind of where it's been going forward to see what kind of issues are targeting the more modern and much more hardened versions of Windows. Um, I'm at sort of NWR, that's the slight brand of things away. Um, I work on the research team, uh, generally looking at native code security, embedded devices, network appliances, things like that. Uh, research wise, I'm generally being focused on reverse engineering this Windows, playing around with exploits, and kind of trying to automate myself out of the job. Uh, so this is going to be a very survey style talk. Um, there will be some demos at the end, including one that I haven't really released publicly yet, and a few other things. Um, there's a bunch of references throughout. Um, I kind of have a repo which I've done kind of for the kind of most useful kind of security related stuff I see, and which I'll take very quickly. Uh, so we can start going through kind of why do we want to do kind of exploitation, what's the interest there, and why do you need to. Uh, I'm going to go into what the attack service Windows looks like. Um, with Master Windows, we generally look at when we're doing kind of bug hunting, or uh, Master Windows have been targeted in, in block attacks. Um, and then go through the approach that people take into find these bugs. Uh, for digging into the kind of engineering code, we might split into piling against them, but some of from Intel as well. Uh, and I'll we'll go through exploiting CPU 16255, which the Russians brought on Google last year, and then uh, some extra detail on porting that across to the anniversary of the Windows, which it originally didn't have. So, the motivation. Uh, back in the day, you dropped the browser exploit the user, flash exploit, got them to click something. Um, you get all user privileges that probably be running as local admin and all sorts of fun stuff, and you could just go about and start editing, dumping credits, uh, move on, do the next thing. Sadly, well, for us, not the rest of the world, um, people have their lives to have. Uh, now, most uh, kind of targeted software are getting in some kind of sandboxing, and these are getting increasingly elaborate uh, to lock down what you do. So, you contact a few. Compromise browser process, but from there you can do basically nothing uh, with trapped inside a sandbox. And generally, we'll have the browser process for the broker to privilege things as the user. So, from there, you'll we'll have to try and attack part of the moments to escape. This has been going on for a while. Um, so, protective mode was introduced in 2006, and um, it was kind of terrible. You could basically still do what you want, and it was on my profile, and it was a bit rubbish. Um, but these have kind of got better and better. Uh, in Windows 8, they introduced uh, process integrity and uh, sample processes will gain more integrity, which gave them a lot less access to system resources, system APIs, stuff like that. Um, and as they've been increasingly relevant, even Firefox now has a functioning sandbox um, about at least five years far too late. Uh, so, again, once we compromised a client, we're stuck in the sandbox, uh, we need to find something to break out of that or achieve more. Um, you can attack sandbox brokers, um, this is the kind of component the browser we use to do more British operations. However, that's got a much smaller limited attack surface. There's been quite a few sandbox bugs in the past, but they're kind of steadily decreasing. And if you look at things like the latest phones, where you'll see kind of less and less uh, broker exports appearing, more people are kind of resorting to having to get the kernel to. Do this. And fundamentally, the kernel of course is just how a gigantic attack service. Um, so, I mean, with the 2K and the drivers, and it's like in kernel mode, and the are is responsible for a huge proportion of all the policy windows. Uh, so, a quick bit of background knowledge. Uh, so, Windows are against access token objects, which are checked when you try to do anything on the system. This is kind of equivalent to cookies on a web app, etc. Um, there are many methods for escalating your privilege to the system. Um, the kind of most straightforward one is use an exploit to compromise the process running a system, steal its access token, and start using that to be web fancy. You can also do things like increase the permission to your own access token and give it the ability to inject code into a process running system, shove up shell code on there, cause it to execute it, right? Um, also, kind of pre fairly recent versions of Windows 10, um, what you do is if you've got right access to the system process, just overwrite 
get security script and not point it at my default that file and inject code away. I don't know what so what does this access look like? Um, so obviously with a lot of kernel modus attack servers, traditionally everything, pretty much everything seen in the wild has focused on attacking system calls in the system, drivers, and pod pass on logic. So what is a system call? What does that look like on Windows? Um, fundamentally, system calls are used by using my processes to do things which are a real impact on the system. Um, so in Windows, you access the data generally via a handful of DLLs, the main ones being MTDLL or use by HDI. Um, and one kind of key thing to note here is that Windows 32K Assist, which is a graphic subsystem, supports many, many more system calls than the NTOS kernel does, which is part of the that and makes your policy system run. So with PTK, it's the main Windows graphics driver. Um, so it was written in the 90s, and really ran, originally ran in music mode. It was eventually ported to kernel for performance reasons, and has been a gift to foreign governments and intelligence agencies ever since. Um, so fundamentally, the issue here is that Windows PTK was written in the 90s with very little regard to security. It's running in kernel mode, and it's very kind of poorly designed from a security perspective. Um, and this is a taken from job posting for Windows Devices Group, uh, which is one of our components with Windows Devices. It's the vector for 60% or more, but more of all Windows kernel mode exploits and the top of your path tables on that every year. Uh, so even with Microsoft they're making this is kind of their number one easy target if you want to file those in kernel. NTOS now uh, as we stated implements kind of the core kernel functionality, so things like threats and processes, virtual memory, memory management, and registry. Uh, so this is substantially less targeted, um, has a lot less CVEs in public, there's bugs found in it generally, um, but there's just a lot less attack surface there, there's a lot less weird functionality in like passing images and drawing things. Uh, so drivers, uh, another kind of core system component, is used for checking your hardware, whether it's ever, um, various other peripherals, etc. Um, also updating things like firmware, updating microcode, the driver, things like that. Um, so antivirus companies love using uh, drivers for doing things like inspecting files, which they've written to, um, unpacking files, processing images, all sorts of lovely stuff. Um, and also anti-cheat. Um, so a lot of video games will ship with kernel drivers that will plug into the source of the in the system. So how do we come up with drivers? This is kind of similar to the system call scenario. Um, so you send them, you call a bunch called NTE IO control code. Um, basically what it consists of is you send a number which identifies the functionality of the driver's trigger, you give it an input buffer, you give it size, and the buffer and the input buffer size, and this is used to give the memory um, and information between the two. And you can also use shared memory um, where the driver will map in read any user space which you'll be able to read and write to and kind of share data across there. And this is quite generally what it was about. Um, sadly, drivers do terrible, terrible things. Um, so for these four drivers, the entry side of green and kind of core functionality they need to load and just kind of exist in the system. Uh, the stuff highlighted in red is just where they completely break the security model altogether and anyone who bothers to ask can just kind of do things like arbitrary write to uh, memory or Read config registers and stuff that you should just never have access to if you're using it. Uh, as a lot of people will be happy to all sign as well and freely available in the address. So, font passing and to kind of round off the attack surface. Fonts are actually mentally, mentally complicated. Um, a lot of them include things like small instruction sets to kind of instruct the computer how to render the fonts, etc. Um, and traditionally, this has been done in Windows 2K running within the kernel, um, which just makes this a great target for finding kind of traditional C style random corruption issues. So, moving on to bug hunting and kind of how people approach finding bugs that they have not exploited Windows kernel. Um, MWR has spent entirely too much time trying to test Windows kernel. Um, so, it's a year we have three different people write kernel buzzers. And on basically the entire planet. Um, one of those we made open source. Um, and the kind of process of this kind of effectively goes down to 
spend a bunch of time reverse engineering the Windows kernel, get a bunch of library functions, reverse engineer system call numbers, what arguments they take, put these into a library function as you can call, get buzz values for all the types you know, save any handles returned, uh, use them later, randomly pass them to system calls, and then just kind of randomly go through the calls and functions, logging them, executing them, seeing if it crashes, and then just keep looping until it crashes, just doing weird, weird stuff with the kernel. Um, and I mean, this is kind of from uh, Project Nils did for Project Zero. Um, and basically, if you do this and leave it running, you will just get all the bugs and it just kind of rains. Uh, code review generally isn't, an isn't an option for Windows stuff. Obviously, they have the uh, mainstream uh, example of a very well source company, or they have at the time. Um, however, sometimes people do things like leak the NT4 source code, um, which is where you look at them, you can basically find the bug we'll talk about later, um, which is I've been publicly available for years and years, um, find it by Google. Uh, another option um, is to effectively do code review, but by manually reversing the environment. There's some things that help there. Um, additionally, if you want to do any kernel fuzzing, most of what you're going to look at is in public document, so you have to manually reverse engineer all that before you fuzz it. So, increasingly, Windows binaries have some public debugging symbols. You can get things like argument names, some function names, and stuff. Um, whether that's even to keep with Windows 7, um, kind of, as you look at Windows 10, you might do seem to find a lot less symbols in public. Um, but additionally, there's things like React OS, which is a project to create a kind of compatible open source uh, Windows OS. Um, that's a lot of this already reverse engineered, which can be a really good starting point to help you get to grips with things. Um, you can also do things like narrowly target reverse engineering. So, for example, if your project gets a crash, um, go in and have a look at the function that might be bugs in your line and more useful than what you found. Um, but fundamentally, the kernel is gigantic, and even the kind of Done fuzzers that I just outlined are still very quickly finding bugs with kind of even minimal amounts of compute. Um, and James and Georgie ran theirs, they were always running like 12 posts and within half an hour you'd have a new kernel up. Uh, so, I mean, why bother with the effort? Uh, third party drivers, um, straight up manual reversing. So, a lot of the core Windows drivers will be massive and kind of fully reverse with you know manually, even if you're not work. But a lot of third party drivers are very small, they're quite basic functionality. All too often, they just do things like map curl memory into user mode. And so, this, for a lot of people, this has been a very good source of kind of easy bugs. Um, there's been a few tools released to help do this. Um, I released one uh, like a week later, and CC released a bad one. Um, I've been adding some features and making one a bit prettier since. Um, I'm going to play with that. Uh, driver fuzzing follows a similar model to kernel fuzzing. Um, once you've worked out what IO control codes a driver supports, you can just start throwing random data at that or do a bit of engineering, target a bit. Um, and Isaac have released a kind of smart driver puzzle that's a bunch of things like looking for common driver patterns and searching for kernel pointers and output buffers. Um, that makes it super easy. You can just do whatever in a pipe and set the data at the end. Um, and this is been used by a lot of people behind the in the driver file. Uh, in terms of form, uh, kind of form processing as a tag service, this has been very fuzzing heavy. Um, Juru has, uh, who works Project Zero, has generally been accused of kind of killing all the bugs here because he's been doing a crazy amount of very targeted fuzzing for years and years, and obviously he has quite a bit of compute power available, which slightly outclasses how well you can solve this. Patch shipping is also kind of a kind of well known thing people do. Um, so before and after Patch Tuesday, see what's changed from the kernel. Quite often, if there's been a kernel bug, the kind of change will be fairly obvious. It will be kind of, okay, suddenly they're checking this pointer before calling it. It's probably something suspicious here. Uh, so this was an example from CVE 2014 for free, which was used by Sandworm, I think, on this really large PowerPoint across the Pentagon graphics. Um, and this was fairly obvious. It was a function to point at a full patch, you didn't check it, after the patch it did. Um, and sure enough, it turned out you could just kind of put whatever value you wanted there. I think it ended up being an error mode, so it ended up reading from user memory and it was just kind of progress. 
So mitigations, um, obviously, especially if you're something like the Windows kernel, going through and doing code review over the entire thing, making sure everything's perfect, is kind of not a feasible engineering exercise. So people have been trying to bolt on various protections, both in the CPU and the kernel, over the years, um, in order to kind of make this harder, make life a lot harder for attackers, kind of raise the cost of doing kernel for development. Um, so kind of so to describe the kind of how these mitigations work, what value they provide, and the steel uh, taxonomy that Ben Hawks used during his use of Nico uh, presentation. Um, so this is the kind of various different ways they look at export mitigations. So type zero is a mitigation which just ends a lot of like this software is just no longer ever exploitable. Type one is a kind of specific exploitation technique. Uh, type two is removing Attack surface, which is completely removed really much time to see together. And then type 3 is, for example, something like SLR, which didn't make any bugs kind of completely non exploitable, but it did mean that you either need more bugs or you need kind of select circumstances in order to take advantage of it. So there's an incredible number of mitigations in modern Windows from kind of all of those categories, um, especially on the kind of specific technique blocking. Um, if you've ever looked at the MS and the kind of technique blocking, so they're kind of very specific. Um, I'm going to kind of cover the key ones and some of the recent, more interesting ones that kind of stopped the usage of some settings, which were very nice to have. Um, and also, Windows 10, with every kind of significant update, there is stuff being changed massively. Um, and it's probably crazy how fast that's happening. So, once upon a time, um, circa, I guess, Windows 7, so not that long ago actually, um, probably still on your client networks. Um, so, Kernel memory was not no execute, um, so you could just load stuff into kernel memory that execute a shell code, um, but you could just map some shell code into user mode. If you've got a vulnerability which let you overwrite a pointer or take control of a pointer, so say you can write to any address, overwrite a pointer from the kernel, if you get stack overflow, or a return address for pointer in user mode, just map your own shell code, mark execute for yourself, the kernel will just follow that straight away, one might be massive. Um, and then Intel wrote everything. Um, so in 2012, they introduced a feature called Supervisor Mode Execution Prevention, uh, which is generally called SMEP because the full name's a bit verbose. Um, so this was first of all in Windows 8. Uh, basically, if the kernel attempts to execute code that's just running in the user address space, it will just blue screen the system back up. Uh, this is kind of a type of mitigation, and it kind of massively raised the bar. So if you're trying to exploit like trivial standard back stack up overflows, suddenly you're gonna to have to do some elaborate kernel return or program stuff rather than just mapping show over and winning. <coughs> um, so it's not the same bypass as the kind of similar user mitigations had. So obviously you can do data only attacks, like uh, access tokens are just data, so if you can one of those, copy those, move them about, uh, you can also do like return to programs on gadgets and what the they work. Um, or alternatively, you can just get Capcom to turn it on for you. Um, <laughs> just, it's almost like, so this was something I realized from here on the train went in between stops. Um, it was kind of very, my first CTF driver. Um, and luckily, it's signed and it's allowed there and attackers not it. Uh, so additionally, uh, once you've stopped people being able to execute whatever they fancy, you also want to stop them being able to find things that are wrong. Uh, these kind of randomizing where things are located and stopping people executing them kind of go together strongly as a component because then you start leaking data, etc., to find out where things live so you can do code reuse attacks and do data only attacks. Um, so this was introduced in Vista, but it was quite crappy for a while. Um, and it's got a lot stronger with each, especially from 64 bit, it's got a lot stronger, but you can't just guess and group all the rest of them. Much have to rely on some kind of leak from somewhere. Um, so, tr luckily, traditionally, Windows has been very generous in giving you access to bypass this. Um, so, NT query system information is kind of the canonical example. Um, so, this was an undocumented API for getting information about the system, especially in the kernel. Um, so, this included uh, based on the arguments you gave, it, this included things like giving you where every object lives in the system and what's addressing kernel like memory was. Uh, things like telling you where every driver is loaded, uh, which was very nice if you're doing a programming. You can just find out, okay, where well, it does, in particular, this will live. Okay, I'm aware that the gadgets are processing that. I'll just do a bit of math and I win. Uh, 
Sadly, luckily, um, in Windows 8.1, uh, they stopped low integrity processes having any access to that. So from within a sandbox, you'll no longer be able to use this at all. Um, whereas if you manage to compromise get the usage directly with a binary or something, you'll still be able to access this because you're running in the containers. Um, this is kind of continued. Um, so this is a project where I've been slowly kind of documenting and making these various various characteristics um, from across the years. Um, which can be surprisingly hard because most of these functions, including the documented, generally only ever used for exploits. Um, so you find a lot of code on weird forums that hasn't been updated since like 2004. Um, but one good thing that I show is that with kind of each release of Windows, Microsoft is plugging these holes very quickly. Um, so bypasses, which have been there since the dawn of time, are very quickly disappearing. Uh, another big one Microsoft did, and some would argue probably too late, um, is make an on-point difference is no longer um, exploitable. Um, so this is a super common C, C++ coding error. Like, you don't make sure a point is valid when it gets past you, you call it and that stuff happens. The user mode is just crash because in kernel mode, back in the days, you can able to kind of call compromise. Uh, so as a Windows 7 64 bit, this has been fixed. So you can no longer map an old page at all. Um, so generally what you do here is you map an old page, but some kind of data to move the control flow, or if you can't for it, executed an old pointer, you to load your shell over there. Um, that's kind of completely gone, you can't map the first page in memory anymore, that's just not an option. Um, weirdly, this was still enabled in Windows 7 32 bit, so they could have the DOS application and Windows support still work, um, which I'm sure a lot of people care about. Um, this is kind of completely killed a kind of Probably the most common previous to this class as well, because it was so easy to find. Um, again, so this was a mutation brought in this technique. Um, so previously, when you set the pointer to a screw script of an object to null, Windows would default to just failing open, so then any user could do what they can to that object and could do things like inject shell code. Um, so recently, we changed it to the security script of your as null, and it's a process. And the script requires when I get set, blue screen the system. Um, next, you did a call right with us, there was a group relation to here, didn't how it worked. Um, this is kind of completely blocked that technique, um, it's kind of a full mitigation for that time to extend privileges. Um, another good one they've done is they've moved the form passing out the kernel, well, mostly. Um, so now the font passing is predominantly done inside a kind of lockdown app container. So there's kind of various we can do with that now. Um, well, not across the font engine, but what we're in is kind of a process where you might have less access than you did before in the first place. Uh, additionally, um, this is kind of quite a recent one, but Chrome and Edge have done some work for in their sandboxes. You can't access most of Windows 2K, uh, which obviously takes away all the system that you previously in Arctic. Uh, another thing Microsoft's been heavily pushing, especially given the recent wave of kind of leaks from our kernel exploits, is what they call virtualization security. Um, so this is delivered as part of device guard. Um, so this is part of Microsoft's strategy for using Hyper-V and hyperspace security to enhance the security of the host operating system. So this is where the operating system gets set up, it runs within Hyper-V itself. Hyper-V does a bunch of implementation and modifications to the running kernel in order to make things more secure. So examples of this are things like kernel control flow guard. Um, so this limits what functions you can pull, so it makes rock much harder in user mode. Previously, it can be able to kernel mode because the core part of the kernel looks at the kernel who watches the watches. And the answer is they've gone one level lower. So now the hypervisor will enforce that in kernel mode code. They've also done things like kernel mode code integrity, so they were the sign code in the kernel. Um, and kind of a niche one, MPIP, I'll give some brief details on. And um, we'll have a good example here where they talk about how the exploit treatment is by shadow brokers, uh, what components of virtual they need for security to stop them running on the system. Um, so, MPIP is something I looked into because Alex INSQ tweeted at me, and if you Google it, and you found this other tweets from him, and they're actually information. Um, so this is taken from the Hyper-V specification. Uh, effectively what this does is there were a bunch of instructions that in Intel manipulate a bunch of core structures used by the processor in the operating system. And while the right versions of those instructions 
uh, kind of always being limited to firmware, the user can't use them. The re-instructions for kind of arbitrary design choices made a long time ago, back when they wouldn't matter, uh, could always bring up the state. So this was kind of a CPU level information leak that Microsoft just couldn't patch in the kernel. Um, and for example, so if you can use SIT, you can kind of the script table with this, and every time, say, if you use it as a keystroke, you can have that execute your work instead. Um, obviously, this is information that probably should have never been exposed to useful in the first place, um, but it's quite hard to get rid of once it's there because it's baked into the hardware and it's going to tell a lot of facts about the ability. Uh, so, Microsoft effectively resorted to implementing the functionality in front of each of happening. So, if you turn on that function, you get fake data back when you execute those instructions. Um, and this is also a feature that Intel is now baking into their CPUs. Um, so, if you have more ones, the latest release Intel CPUs, the feature called using the construction engine, which does the same thing at a hardware level. Uh, so now I'm going to talk through CD 2016, 7255, um, exploiting that um, kind of as it was really found in the wild, and then move on and talk about exploiting that on a later version. Uh, so this was a uh, kernel exploit originally packaged with a flash OD. Uh, it was fired at someone from Google because they were the first ones to disclose it um, at the end of last year um, from unknown attackers. Um, so then what this kernel uh, exploit included uh, was a information link to leak data up kernel where things are located and a kernel memory corruption vulnerability which allows you to for any value you could for. Um, by combining these, um, the exploit worked for system level code execution on Windows 7 to 10, 32 bit and 64 bit. Um, the source code for this exploit is available online. Um, that does include the updates which are available which I'll post on Monday. Uh, so fundamentally it's a data link, data link. Um, so this was a function called HMWA handle. Um, this was kind of completely undocumented as I exported in order to get into this. Uh, this was actually they loaded user day two and did a bunch of passing logic within it to find out where it was in memory. Um, basically what this does is you can pass it a handle to a Windows UK object. It will copy the entire thing into user mode memory and then give you a pointer to that. Um, luckily most structures, um, so the example we use is win. Uh, luckily, they include a bunch of points to kernel mode, including a point to where the data themselves are located. Uh, so, at that point, you can use that to target the memory corruption exploit at manipulating fields on that data structure. So, what's the corruption process? Uh, so, fundamentally, you have a window object. Uh, this is represented in kernel memory by a tackling structure. Um, on that structure, there's a function called, called NTUser 781 pointer. So this lets you modify fields within that structure. There's a bunch of logic in there that stops you from modifying it as randomly operating pointers. One of these uh, just wasn't protected. Um, so you could call the relevant system call, modify that value, and that be used in later functions as a pointer. Uh, so then when triple X next window was called, it would take that mod value that's modified, use it as a pointer to something else, and it would for it plus that plus 28 the value of four. So what this effectively gives you is a exploit you can use to flip any sixthly significant byte in a bit in a byte uh, at any address within system memory. So the way this set up is create basically those window objects, use the information link to find out where they're in memory. Uh, find two of them that have been loaded into memory close enough together that you can later use the memory corruption to actually want to write each other. Obviously, just all the spare ones. Uh, for anyone that exists, the incredible number of windows that ran with gray. Um, so, what happens here is there's a field called secret window extra room attack window. What this is is extra memory after attack window structure in memory. Uh, ID box is zero. Um, but you can probably see where this is going. So obviously we have a flash box that's set a bit on the value, uh, and we have our two windows that are close enough in memory that we can corrupt that value, make it longer, make it through the other window. And because we have the ability to randomly write to that spare memory data, we can then use the first window, 
pool functions to multiply functions for second data. So first of all, we need to turn this into arbitrary read write um, so that we can do up to all test our privileges. First thing we do is use this to create an arbitrary read from the different kernel. Uh, so what we do is we use the first window to modify the SPWing parent field of the second window. Um, so there is a function call which will go to our pointer and read back to it's there. This is generally to get basically the parent window of the new object you're looking at. Um, so what we do is we calculate the gap between the two, use NT, uh, use the set extra data function, I can't remember the name of that operating line, to override that with an address that we found to read it. Okay. Uh, and then we can all NT use a gas tester to read that data, which gives us 32 bit reads at a time. Obviously, you can shift that address across and read it to the values and open read kernel monitors. Uh, again, we also want to use this same bug to give us a write primitive. Uh, it's nice to be able to leak arbitrary kernel memory, but it looks really good to be able to actually start manipulating things. Um, luckily, this one's a bit simpler. Um, so there's a name field on a tag window object, and what we can do is, with a similar logic to before, use the first window, overwrite that field in the second window, have that point somewhere else. Then we call set window text to change the name of that window. It's going to write whatever text, whatever name we've given it to that address in memory, um, allowing us to kind of write part of the data that we fancy. So now that we can read and write whatever we fancy, how do we actually have the privileges with this? So luckily, tag window field equals pointer to tag thread. Tag thread equals pointer to the e thread, which is basically the structure that represents that thread execution within the kernel. Uh, we can then follow that to take the C state, then we can find the process structure that represents the process we're running it. And this includes a bunch of helpful detail of what process of it is. Also, a uh, double list that includes every other process object and a copy of the pointer to our security token in memory. So, what we're going to do is we'll find a process ID that we know is running the system. We'll Grab the point to this token and we'll just overwrite that over our own. And now we have the permissions that was previously run. Right. Um, I have four recorded demos this time, so I did this before and they kind of did it repeatedly. So if you might say, well, that would be worth passing that. Okay, so this is going from a local user, just a basic proof there. I can't write to my own desktop. Yeah, you know, my test user. I'm also running the exploit. So as well, check all the windows are on, set a bunch of offsets and system all numbers. Then we do some math to make this a bit more portable. We can kind of dynamically work out some offsets and where the HM validate handle function lives. We then do all the setups, and that was create the windows, it's found our two targets of windows, it knows what our CV window the data field is, and what it needs to write to to corrupt it. Uh, now this is the memory corruption trigger. Uh, you can make this a bit more subtle if you want to, uh, but basically the tab link is causing it to call the next window function. So that will be triggered. Now it's used our arbitrary memories to traverse the process list find the pointer to the kernel token we want to steal. And now it's going to trigger the write to overwrite our own security token and swap the match up. And let's start shouting. It's terrible now. Yeah, you are. So, sadly, so this was originally found a while before the anniversary update was released, and in between the two versions, Microsoft added some more exploit mitigations. So, when we try to run this on the anniversary update, what we get is a blue screen, it's actually the bugger, and we get this desktop key pointer out of range. And I don't know what the hell this is, this is something you might have seen before. And so fundamentally, what happened was, Microsoft kind of knew this was an issue, it had been a year fixing it, and we're kind of just too late to the mark to pushing the extra mitigation support publicly. 
Um, but luckily, immediately after they bragged about how their new exploit arm was going to stop this exploit, uh, someone else had a look and found a nice way to bypass it. Uh, so fundamentally, we want to see what's changed. Like, does our read exploit still work? Does our write exploit still work? Um, luckily for read, it turns out the function we're using is basically identical. Hasn't changed. There's been a few registers moving. Nothing's happened. If we look at the functions that are called. They're all literally identical as well. Like nothing is changing for read. Um, so, minimal changes, we can just remove the write, update a few system call numbers, and now our read exploit will work again. So, here we're tripping memory corruption, we're going through, we're reading all the memory to a poor, funny token steal, but our write it doesn't work, so we're going to stop at that point. So fundamentally, the change that happened to the function we're using to write is a call to this desktop verify e plus unicode string was added, uh, and this is what's causing it to do through. Basically, what this does is it verifies that the name of the window is within the memory range the kernel uses to manage uh, desktop windows, menus, things like that, um, by comparing this to another structure of memory. The string makes sense, like there's no Justifiable reason that endpoints would ever be outside of a desktop in normal circumstances, unless there's either some kind of programming bug or someone's trying to pull off an exploit. Um, however, luckily, it takes this from the tag desktop structure, which it gets appointed to from tag wind, which we have arbitrary read writing. Uh, what we do is we find the tag desktop pointer, read it, save the copy, overwrite it to the point to using our memory. Fake will provide values that get past the text, overwrite string name, talk into user data text. Our new values look perfectly valid, so that'll go ahead. And then we can put values back quickly uh, before anything realizes anything's gone amiss. Now you see how that works. And fundamentally, this allows us to go back to overwriting our true memory again. As you see, this is how that's real here. So I don't need to emphasize far too much. Then everything's set up, we're ready to go. Memory corruption, a little bit of time. There you go, and that was system again on what at the time was the latest version of Windows. Uh, so, in conclusion, Windows Service has a massive, ridiculous attack surface. Export development is becoming harder and more expensive, but it's not going to get time soon, especially for people who are kind of heavily invested in this as an operating model. Um, and also OEMs will just destroy the security of whatever you do. Questions? So you said that uh, some of the new mitigations have removed the trivial exploits if you've got a classic buffer or something. So is it the case now that if you find, uh, say, uh, write whatever you want, wherever you want, primitive in the kernel, you still got a lot of work to do to work out how to exploit that, or are there generic things you just write, I've got this primitive, I know now exactly what to do to so right anywhere you can still use um, using kind of public embedding techniques, um, but they're going to be gone in Redstone two. Redstone three is my general understanding. Um, so if you're lucky enough to find arbitrary right, which is incredibly rare, um, just about be there. Um, but things like a classic stack overflow is now like you're going to have to chain that with 
a weird info leak as well, because you have to find like library locations, and there's no kind of generic stuff for that. You're going to need another vulnerability. So, anyone else? Any more? Okay, thank you.